everyone to today's webinar on using data to inform therapeutic responses to child sexual abuse. My name is Antonia Quadara and I'm a Senior Research Fellow here at the Australian Institute of Family Studies. I'd like to start by acknowledging the, um, with an acknowledgement of country and of the Bunurong and Wurundjeri people, traditional custodians on the land on which I'm speaking to you in Melbourne and also pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging of the Kulin Nation and extend that respect to other elders and Indigenous Australians who are attending this webinar. Today, we are talking about practice data um, and research and information and how that can contribute to better outcomes for child victims of child sexual abuse. So when we're talking about practice data, this could be service administrative data, client outcomes data, it could be evaluation data. And the question is, what's the role that information and data has to improve service outcomes and service design? And the important role that practitioners and service providers play in collecting this data. And now that pertains to whether you're um, working specifically as a therapist um, therapeutically with victim survivors of child sexual abuse or across the broader service systems that interact with victims and their families like child protection, community support services, criminal justice and the mental health systems. And we're also going to be talking about the barriers and challenges and opportunities for data-driven practice and we'll talk a little bit about what we mean by data before kicking that off um, in responding to child sexual abuse. Joining me are two people who've been wrestling with these uh, issues um, and their tensions um, in, on a daily basis. We have Dr. James Herbert and Amanda Payton. Before introducing our presenters, I'd like to acknowledge the questions that people have sent in and the breadth of, breadth of things that people are interested in. Um, and particularly to know more about including things like how to respond to disclosures of child sexual abuse, um, how to support um, non-offending family members. Um, we won't be covering these issues today, however they are vitally important ones and we've gathered together a suite of resources around responding to disclosures um, and other research that you can access to provide some of this information. So to our presenters, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. James Herbert, who is a Senior Research Fellow at the Australian Centre for Child Protection at the University of South Australia. James is a social researcher who is and has been looking at um, barriers to therapeutic engagement for victims of child victim survivors of um, sexual abuse um, and on the effective deliberation procedures uh, for multidisciplinary team case review. So it's researchers like James who uh, rely heavily on program data and service data to help inform his work. Welcome James. Um, Hi Antonia, how are you? Good, good. You're coming to us from Adelaide? Uh, Perth, Perth, Perth. Uh, the Westopia. Um, yeah, uh, thanks so much for the invite. Really excited to be uh, talking about the topic. It's a really ambitious title, so hopefully we can deliver on it. I'd maybe more conservatively have gone with the title of, I would really like to use data to inform therapeutic response to sexual abuse, but um, you know, you got to sell the sizzle. <laughs> I'm sure we will, James. And I'd also like to uh, welcome Amanda Payton, the, who's the Deputy Director of Practice at the Australian Centre for Child Protection at the University of South Australia, um, and who also works with James. Amanda's been, um, has worked as a clinical psychologist. Hello, Amanda. Um, Hello. And oversees the research and provides policy advice to the Department of Communities um, Royal Commission team and Specialist Child Protection Unit. So Amanda sits um, right at the intersection of where research um, meets practice. Um, and brings real insight to the challenges and opportunities as at that crossover point. Welcome, Amanda. Hi, Antonio. Thanks for having us. Pleasure. Um, I don't, I'm not going to hazard a guess about where you are because I think you were going to be one place and now you're not, and I was already wrong with James, so we won't do that. <laughs> I was, I'm, in, I'm in WA. I'm in Perth as well. The, uh, the, board, the border changes didn't like me this week, so I uh, know uh, Adelaide for me. Okay, so now we're getting into the, the nuts and bolts where there will be sizzle, James, there will be sizzle. Um, 
So before we dive into the discussion about using data and research in practice and service planning and service design, let's start a little bit um, by setting the scene, starting with you, James, um, around the research that you've been doing um, and that you've actually published for CFCA. Um, so let's start, I guess, with the descriptive and then also some of the sort of challenges that you encountered. So um, what does the evidence tell us about um, children um, accessing therapeutic services, I guess, in the first instance or getting referred to them, um, engagement and completion? Um, what do we know about, uh, I guess, the kind of uptake, if you like, but also the factors that influence that and the factors that influence um, engaging in that therapeutic process and staying engaged? Yeah, yeah, cool. Just, yeah, speak to that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I guess the starting point for this and so what sort of framed some of my thinking around this was really working on multi-agency responses for the last couple of years, which is, I guess, the, the meshing together of all these different disciplines and agencies that really need to be involved when child sexual abuse is occurring and, and specifically working in you know, child advocacy centre research, both in the US and in Australia. So the way they think about, I guess, the, the connection to therapy is they're doing an integrated response. So, you know, referral and engagement with therapy is one of the key outcomes that they're really monitoring as part of the, the holistic response, joined in with, I guess, the, the police, child protection, sort of forensic um, and interviewing response. So from, there's, there's a lot of research on child advocacy centres. And, and I guess what I really found was it really uh, emphasised, I guess, the justice aspects. And there was there's a lot of research primarily about, I guess, disclosures and you know interviewing practice and things like that. And one of the gaps I really found was, I guess, the contribution of that warm referral of having that child and family advocate that's there doing that work, addressing barriers to access and that sort of thing. So that sort of got me thinking about how you might study this in an Australian context. Um, so I guess as a preparation for that, I, I undertook this uh, systematic search of the literature, uh, found about 4,000 articles, which then were narrowed down to 49, uh, then did some you know, fancy meta-analysis stuff to be able to sort of take similar studies and, and lump them together in order to, to arrive at some rates that tell us something about the rate at which uh, children engage and you know, complete therapy services, as, as well as some of the factors that influence whether they, um, you know, the fact the factors that influence those rates. So I guess the, the more, and, and, and um, I understand you guys have sent the link to the papers. So um, I guess the, the main bits that we sort of found was the sort of full sample. So all kids that got an interview that were sent off into the world, you know, studies that were sort of following them, only about 30% were really making it to services, whereas where there was specific referral, so if police or child protection had you know, made a specific referral, you know, here's a piece of paper, go to the service, showing up about 60% of the time, whereas families initiating contact and you know, going through a wait list or eligibility process, they're, they're actually commencing the service about 80% of the time. For completions, we sort of separated them into the really controlled experimental studies where there's a lot of, you know, you've got to meet this criteria to be in this trial. Um, they're sort of like completing at a rate of about 74%, whereas uh, the service is much more out in the community, much less, you know, sort of you know, structure and, and control around the eligibility, um, about 50, 59% complete. So what we're getting and what this all up sort of means is that uh, for people that are sort of sent off to services, anywhere between 18 and 35% are actually getting to the point of completing those services so those are the ones that are you know, potent, you know, potentially getting the benefit of these services. Higher, of course, if the family are initiating services. And yeah, it just got me thinking like, in that pipeline, there's a lot of holes. There's a lot of bits dripping out. Um, and as well, these are primarily US studies. So they reflect primarily child advocacy centers that are doing these really coherent, you know, you know warm referral type responses. And not all jurisdictions in Australia have that. So, you know, potentially our, our rates, you know, could be worse, could be not worse. But I guess more to the point is we don't quite know because there's not a lot of Australian research on this that takes it into account our context and, you know, you know, our situation. 
so I guess that's um, sort of what got me fired up about this topic and um, and, and and thinking about it. Did you okay. want to say something? I didn't want to like monopolize the, the, the mind. No, no, that's fine. I'll um, uh, talk to Amanda in a tick, but you said um, that there are a lot of holes in that pipeline. Can you just expand on that? What do you, is that research holes, data holes, service holes? What, what are we talking about here? Yeah, I guess I guess from working and studying multi-agency systems, I, I'm thinking about it all as, as one system. And those, those holes, really what we're talking about is the systems of referral and intake to this, those services. So in Australian jurisdictions, you know, you might be getting a piece of paper with a list of services, and you know maybe the paper is up to date maybe it's not maybe you know it has the proper eligibility criteria maybe it doesn't if you're in a you know a, a jurisdiction with a really well developed connection between the therapeutic side and the investigative side you might be getting a child and family advocate or an advocate counselor that are sort of walking with you through that and uh, i guess addressing some of the barriers you might have whether they be attitudinal reluctant to seek mental health care for your children because of your own negative experiences with mental health systems, um, all sorts of things. So I guess what I what I mean by those leakages is um, we, we don't have a clear idea about how some of those different systems and processes are affecting the accessibility of these services. And, and those leaks are, I, I guess what I'm imagining and what I've seen in other jurisdictions and you know, particularly in the US where they've, they've studied and, you know, Done interventions to try and address some of these barriers is there's, there's often like really simple things that can be done to I, I guess address um, some of these barriers whether it just be someone going with them to you know establish a new therapeutic relationship or make it less intimidating to access some of those things my, my sense is that there's there's really easy fixes that are just little things that are just to do with system coherency and I would love to see data taking a really um, clear role in helping to, I guess, diagnose where some of these leakages are, as well as working with the sector and you know, and victim survivors to to generate solutions to address some of those barriers. Okay. Okay. So we've kind of you've covered off also a little bit on the um, challenges and limitations in the data that helps us understand. Um, I guess what is the, the kind of um, pathways, if you like, into um, therapeutic uh, services. Amanda, I do have some um, specific questions for you and what um, sort of data we're actually, what we mean by that. But mm -hmm. I just w I wondered if you had any reflections on what James had been talking about from an Australian context, noting he was talking particularly about, you know, the, the research literature is often quite US heavy. Yeah. I think that we have a, you know, the obvious one is our geographical spread, and that's that's hugely problematic in Australia, um, and that that's an ongoing issue, and we have a a, a sparsity of um, a population as well in certain areas, so that makes you know that economies of scale for service design and implementation really challenging from a, a policy development and design perspective. I think the one thing though is that you know. We know, picking up from what James said, we we know that it makes sense having someone support families from the point of forensic um, review and assessment, child protection, and then through to therapeutic supports. We know in the you know when we think about uh, children and families who have experienced child sexual abuse and the the acute trauma that they're going through, even just by engaging in that disclosure process. So it makes sense having that. But what we don't have is there's no data that backs up um, why we should invest financially in that as you know uh, from a design perspective it's a really costly type of model having uh, support services bridging that gap and plugging those holes and if we don't have the data to say yes that actually makes a difference it's a very hard case to make to to government or to treasury that that actually that's needed and then that it will make a, a short term and a long term um, impact not just for children and families, but for the broader systems as well, in terms of maybe justice or you know policing and child protection. So, it you need data to be able to demonstrate what we kind of know from a therapeutic perspective is going to help. Yeah. 
so when we're talking, thanks for that, Amanda. When we're talking around, um, you know, we don't have that data um, and using data and research in practice, and you know, we've also within um, describing this webinar talked about data-driven mm -hmm. practice and service mm -hmm. design. I just want to spend a moment, um, I guess, at, at the beginning, and talk about what we mean by data and research in the first place. Um, mm. particularly from your perspective in your minds, James and Amanda, what are the different types of data and research that we're actually talking about? And Amanda, I might stay with you on this for mm. the moment. Mm. What are the types of research and data um, that are relevant to the kind of, I guess, challenges that you just, or issues that you just spoke to then? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as you say, this kind of, I guess, knowing from a therapeutic and almost intuitive sense of, of what um, supports children and families to connect to services and remain engaged, um, but needing to be able to demonstrate that. Um, mm -hmm. what, what's the sort of stuff that matters, re research and data-wise, um, and why why is it important from your perspective? I think um, for me, staying with the data side of it first, which really informs uh, research, I think there's, there's service-driven data, which is, um, you know, outputs, outcomes and satisfaction type data so consumer consumer feedback type data um, and then there's community data so data in terms of mapping need mapping uh, trends prevalence rates those type of things and so there's there's I, I see it as really two two distinct areas where data comes from and but you actually need you need the complete picture you know it's um, if we're if we're drawing a picture of a house and a family, we don't just have the walls. We need the roof and we need the details and we need the family as well as the as well as the picture of the house. You can't just look at certain little individual elements. It doesn't give you the entire um, overview. But then in terms of research, I think then that's split again into kind of two areas of research. So we have the the evaluation uh, research and whether that's Specifically, uh, specifically on uh, like treatment or certain programs, but that really tells us whether something is making a difference and how much of a difference it makes and in what context. And that type of research, I think, relies quite heavily on service-driven data. So um, on, you know, um, service providers capturing, you know, the outputs in terms of the widgets and how many people come through and how many sessions they receive. and but then also the data in terms of the outcomes and, and consumer satisfaction and perception. And, and then there's the research that really looks at so what's going on in the community, almost that kind of descriptive um, em empirical kind of research. And they're, I think they're used very differently, both by a practitioner and by um, you know, policy, uh, policy makers and, and those that are deciding on what type of services to put where. But again, you need both to be able to actually make a significant impact and change within this space. Okay, great. Um, I want to come back to what some of the challenges might be in, in mm -hmm. um, using these two types of data as, as well as the you know service-driven mm -hmm. data. But James, um, I'm going to ask you to weigh in on here as they're you know, thinking about the different types um, of research and, and data, what else do you see as being important for informing um, the you know, practice improvement and service planning? And yeah, design? I guess something that's come up in yeah some of Amanda and I's more recent work, I guess, is the and you know it's probably very germane to the, uh, the papers that I uh, just spoke about is the difference between some of those really controlled clinical trials. So the evidence based for particular interventions, thinking about that. When you have these studies that sort of, you know, they're assessing it essentially in best, the best possible case. So they're screening for, you know, current domestic violence, they're screening for mental health, they're screening for things, because mm -hmm. they just want to test whether the thing works. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have this you know, set of evidence that's really about best possible implementation of the, of the intervention, you know, best possible evidence, but it doesn't really reflect how it's going to be developed like rolled out in the community. So you kind of have this evidence around, hey, if you do this like, you know, multi-million dollar trial with really high fidelity with people that are, you know, video recording the sessions and giving you feedback, here's the effect you're gonna get. But the reality is we're not gonna get that. What we're gonna get in the community are 
and, and that's a whole other area of study, which um, Amanda just sort of mentioned, which is the stuff that we really sort of depend on the community sector in particular to get data from, to, to really understand what these things look like in the community. And I guess that's the that some of the innovation uh, implementation piece, which is the difference between something that's really controlled and implemented in sort of a, a gold standard fashion and what you can deliver in the community to people that are having current distress. You know, you can't kind of find this, you know, sort of perfect, perfect sample within that. You've got to work with the people you've got. You've got to adapt the, the uh, mm. I guess, dimensions you've got to to work with those clients. You know, you might have someone that's, you know, it says session one, you've got to do this. And you're like, this person's screaming at me. Like, you know, you, you've got to kind of work with what you've got. And I think that's some of the challenges for, uh, I think, practitioners is, is the, the gap between the really high quality evidence that gets lots of citations, you know, you know, researchers I worship or whatever, and then the people looking at, well, how do you actually implement this in the community without multi-million dollar implementation teams? Like, and, you know, luckily enough, we've got someone, you know, on the panel that, you know, has, has really wrestled with that and mm. really through about, one, how do you adapt some of these evidence-based interventions to, to work with the people you've got? How do you, I guess, address some of the limitations with the evidence base around the, you know, the types of target groups that you're seeing? And I guess combine it with, uh, you know, some of the different, you know, interventions and approaches that, you know, practitioners have in their tool toolbox. Yeah. Thanks, James. You've set me up perfectly to um, sort of lean in on, on some of the things that um, Amanda had touched on earlier. Um, and as you say, you know, there's, you know, the sort of gold standard evidence. There's also what we... Um, understand therapeutically what comes, you know, basically practice wisdom um, and practice insight around what supports families and children. Um, and I think from looking at the questions as well that have come through, there is a real uh, hunger and interest to know about what, what is best practice um, evidence, what does the evidence tell us, for example, about how to support non-offending family members or um, whether the time, you know, whether the timing of therapeutic interventions matters for the outcomes. So I think you know, we can agree that data and research are important, but what you've both um, touched on, and I, I want to spend, um, I just want to land on it a little while longer, is that that doesn't mean it's necessarily easy to actually um, apply uh, in a sort of real world messy um, context and particularly thinking about the specificities of Australia and our geography and all those sorts of things. So Amanda, I'm mm. interested in, um, from your perspective, given that you um, have, as I said, you know, at the outset, you know, really sat at that intersection of um, bringing research and data, that's service, raw service-driven data, if you like, um, mm. into play in order to improve service design and planning. What are the, I guess, what are the barriers and challenges for program managers, practitioners, um, both in kind of generating that evidence, but also, I, I guess, yeah, applying, you know, the kind of gold standard or, you know, you know, clinical um, experimental research. What are the barriers and challenges that mm. you've identified? And what are the kind of questions that practitioners and program managers and service managers um, can be asking themselves and should be asking themselves about, particularly that the kind of more, you know, set, settled evidence base, if you like, um, mm. Mm. you know, around sort of evaluation and what works? So I double think, barrel, um, sorry, I'm notorious for yeah. the double barrel question. Yeah, I was just, I was just going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to hold over here for a sec the, uh, the issue of the barriers of collecting and generating data because I think that's hugely fraught. So I'll hold that, and if I miss it, poke me again and come back to me. Um, yeah. But in terms of actually looking at, uh, so once you have a clear idea around what your, uh, what your client group is, and in, you know, for today we're talking about child sexual abuse, but Child sexual abuse doesn't occur in isolation. So we have children, young people and families where there's a multitude of other issues and concerns that often are occurring at the same time. They're hugely complex. Now, if I was to look to the research and literature, which I, I did, I started to do probably about 18 kind of years ago when I started working in this area, I found some gold standard evidence-based practice and I thought this is great. I can get training in it and um, it'll be fine and I can use this with my clients. 
And pretty quickly, even though I'd chosen an evidence-based practice um, that was a gold standard, pretty quickly I realised that that absolutely was not going to work with my clients. And so you start to look at things and from a lifting that up to a service uh, design perspective, um, and I spent a, a long time managing a very large uh, specialist psychology team. And one of the things was, well, how do we get training on math for um, for already very well trained um, therapists? Um, how do we support therapists who maybe don't have certain qualifications or experience? Um, how do we pay for that training? And um, how do we pay for the resources that we need to actually implement that training? Quite often in Australia, the training's not available here locally. Um, if you're in Western Australia, you're even more disadvantaged because it's normally on the East Coast. Um, and then you need ongoing supervision and support and peer support and networks for those type of um, implementation of those models as well. And that's before you even look at the, the client group in which you're working. And so, in research, you, as a practitioner looking at research, you need to really dig down into the context at which it was actually um, uh, uh, evidenced. And what you'll often see is they screen out 90% of your clients that come through the door every day. And so it's working only for a, a certain amount of uh, clients, a very tight kind of context. And so as practitioners, then you have to work out, okay, so what elements are going to work for my client? What elements aren't? But then you've got, you grapple with the issue of implementation drift, you know, and if I change it too much and if I alter the way the manual uh, says it works, if I tweak that too much and I don't maybe have the experience and the practice wisdom to do that, what impact is that actually having on the fidelity and on the, um, the outcomes that I might be able to expect for the children that I'm working with and the families. And so it's a hugely complex issue. And I think the only way to actually do it is to make sure that you have really clear data. So you really know the demographic of the clients that you're working with and you know the um, complexities and the challenges that they're coming with which comes from a really thorough assessment that you can then translate into some type of, um, you know, on math kind of number counting, if you like, which sounds quite crass, but you do need to, am I dealing with a service population where 40% also have domestic violence in their background or also experience um, uh, disadvantage or school refusal? You know, is this a common kind of issue that I'm dealing with? Um, so you need to have that data and then you need to have the outcome data because if we're tweaking evidence-based interventions and maybe not delivering them the way the manual says um, or, you know, then we need to be able to look at, is that still working? Am I still making a difference for children and families? And at the end of the day, that's the, the most kind of critical bit. Um, so I think you need to interrogate the research that's there, which is often actually very, very challenging because it's easy to get swept up in the, the glitz and the glamour of the names of people that are producing this research and having, um, and also, you know, um, particularly in Australia, I think being swept up in uh, the latest treatment that's coming over and that's being marketed really well. And not saying it's not evidence-based and it might really work for a certain cohort of people, but you must ask yourself, is it, is it going to work for the clients that you work with? And what data can you actually generate to support that, um, which is really gonna help in terms of your, um, your program reporting and um, you know funding and things like that as well. Mm. So it's um, in part around asking, or inter as you say, interrogating, I guess, what are the kind of assumptions um, that say, you know, a particular um, practice model, you know, you know evidence-based um, practice model that's been evaluated, what are the assumptions that's actually got built within it in terms of who's been screened out? So therefore, who is it working with? Do we actually know what, who it isn't working with? Because those individuals who are likely to form the bulk of children and families that people are actually working with are not part mm -hmm. of that research. Um, yeah. And there's, you know, you know, other questions around how does that, you know, what's the context that this has actually been implemented in? Does it match my context yeah. here? Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like though, to me, those are questions that, um, as you say, like practitioners and service providers 
are completely on top of because that's their, you know, the, the, in a sense, best place to ask those questions and interrogate that research because mm -hmm. they are um, have the client community right in front of them, in front of mind. Absolutely, yeah. And, um, you know, we, we did some reviews a little while ago and um, from a clinical practice perspective. So looking at, so the researchers did summaries on evidence-based practices and then we got our um, clinicians to kind of go, okay, but how does this work in actuality? How does it work within your funding model? How does it work with the clients that come through? Can you get supervision and support and what's the cost of that? And um, so it does have to be translated into a very practical level. And really the practitioners are the only ones that can do that. They're the ones that have to have to take the manual or take the resource and, and try and implement it. And um, so it is a, uh, it, it's a challenge, I think. Mm. So James, you've um, been nodding um, and yes. at the beginning, you, know, you talked about the limitations of data. Um, from your perspective as a researcher, what do you see as being the biggest challenges in, um, you know, we're talking about being data driven. What do you see as being the kind of key challenges that you, you've experienced for services and practitioners? Well, it's going to be a little boring because I mostly agree with Amanda. I was hoping that we'd a few more sparks, but yeah, I, I think absolutely there, there's some real, I guess, present challenges. And I guess thinking about the, the process of evidence moving in, into practice, we, we know it's a very slow one, it's a very indirect one, happens at a snail's pace. I think as well, you don't really want decisions being made off the basis of a single paper. You want an accumulation of evidence informing the way things change. You want it to sort of um, change in, in movements. So I think about resources like the California Clearinghouse in the US, which um, sort of synthesizes evidence and tries to communicate it back to people in a really clear way of, if you have this problem, here are some interventions, this one's rated this way, this one's rated this way, and, and, and there's like really clear things. I, you know, I'd love to see something like that in Australia that, that sort of does that work, not only saying, hey, what's the evidence for it, but how do you adapt it and apply it to an Australian context and take into account, you know, our population, you know, our workforce and, you know, some of the, you know, really important cultural considerations as well. I think the other thing is, and I'm thinking about evidence-based, uh, you know, modalities is, I don't know if you can just expect individuals or expect individual services to do this stuff. I think it takes, it takes a whole service system and it's one thing to say, hey, here are these modalities and, you know, take it and grab it and put it in your toolbox. The other thing is, you know, actually resourcing and actually putting together evidence-based interventions. So instead of saying, hey, we're going to fund this service, we're not going to really determine the content. It's kind of up to you guys if you want to do an evidence-based thing, cool. You know, that might be part of our criteria that we're judging it on but ultimately the content is up to the service provider. And that puts them in a really challenging position is, you know, do you pay for, you know, mm. space training, do you pay to have someone implement and do fidelity checks for this really rigorous intervention, or do you deliver what you know how to deliver? And there's sort of a devolving of, you know, responsibility of, of, of the evidence base for some of these things where, Governments are sort of saying to providers, hey, you guys are doing evidence-based stuff, right? And then at the service level, they're like, hey, individual practitioner, you're using evidence-based practices, right? <laughs> and I, I just think it's, um, yeah, I just think it's the, the, the wrong way to, to go about it is, it, I think it doesn't show a lot of faith and trust in the power of social interventions to actually change. The, but the, the idea that you sort of squeeze uh, I guess the squeeze services to sort of deliver things, you know, the cheapest bang for buck, um, mm -hmm. without saying, hey, you know, how, how do you actually get get these outcomes, you know, effectively? Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I'm talking a bit of a circle there. Uh, I was hoping to find some ground to disagree with Amanda on, but I, I think I agree with her. Just that. <laughs> no, I, I've, we're not here to disagree. We're here to, uh, you know explore the complexities, but um, just on that point around, um, you know, de delivering evidence-based mo modalities, and I, I know that, you know, certainly from the questions we received, there is, and, you know, other research projects that I've worked on, that there is real um, 
interest in, you know, which is best evidence-based practice, you know, for working with victim survivors um, of child sexual abuse who, I don't know, you know, have, you know, complex trauma, you know, just talking off the cuff. And one of the, leaning in on your point, James, around the, the fact that it doesn't take, it's a whole of service system approach. If you're talking about, you know, the sort of specialist services who might, you know, you know, do, be doing the assessment work around where is this, you know, young person at, at, no, and noting that they actually have, might have a whole range of other complexities going on, including, you know, um, learning difficulties or um, other sorts of um, things going on. In the absence of that information coming from other services, it can be really hard to get a, a round, you know, a whole rounded um, assessment. So sometimes there can be that risk not risk but a kind of do people doing work and and sort of improving practice in in kind of isolation of each other um when the the task is trying to you know right back at the point earlier we were talking about that sort of pipeline you know, that whole of service system approach um so i just wanted to sort of reflect that back um and Amanda, I want to come back to you just on the uh, sort of service-driven data. It is something that we've touched on mm. in terms of reporting um, outputs and outcomes, you know, length of engagement, service mm -hmm. episodes, um, mm. or episodes of service, um, and also, I guess, the broader sort of service landscape um, and level of need. But just sticking with the actual, what we might call administrative data, service administrative mm. data. That, um, this is typically part of accountability reporting and sometimes can mm -hmm. feel like a necessary evil um, that may mm -hmm. not have, feels like it doesn't have much return um, for the mm -hmm. service providers, you know, practitioners that are inputting that mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, is this true? Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, both things can be true at once, I think, sometimes. But, um, yeah. and what are the, you know, from your perspective, what are the opportunities here? How, you know, it, it is a necessary evil. So how can that information um, be used and leveraged to improve service responses in your experience for children who mm -hmm. um, experienced uh, sexual abuse and supporting their families? Like, where, where do the opportunities lie? I think, um, you know, when you say kind of when it's progress reporting time, everyone uh, who's online, I'm sure, will groan um, and will be coming up to a to a reporting period at the end of the year as well. Um, and it is it can be kind of reporting for reporting sake. And I think we do sometimes wonder as our service providers, you know, what happens to all that data and what a government in particular doing with that data? And we don't get feedback on aggregated data across the sector. And so that can be a real it can be just disheartening when stuff goes into the pot and information doesn't come back out so that's kind of one thing but if we stick with the the data that we collect um, as a service or as an agency it can really tell us a huge amount in terms of where we've been and where we're heading in terms of trends um, so if i think of uh years and years ago when we're looking at um you know where to put uh, where to put new locations for um, for therapists specialising in child sexual abuse. We didn't just kind of look at a map and go, oh, I really like that area and there's cheap accommodation, let's go there. We actually went to the data. And so we looked to the data in terms of, well, where were our children and families coming from? What demographic, you know, what area, what geographical location? Um, what was the highest kind of ratio? Where are the, then looking at the community stuff in terms of where are train lines, where are bus lines around those collect, the highest collection of people? And can we look at putting a service in there? And we looked at, okay, so we're getting actually more referrals for young people. Well, do we have therapists on staff who can actually deal with young people? And do we have the right uh, treatment options for young people? Um, do we have do we understand young people as a um, as a group well enough within our child practitioners so you know we come up with kind of um, you know other things that we need to think about there do we are we getting more adults into the service with their own child sexual abuse history um, and do we have the right skill set to manage that or if we don't can we actually then link in with other services in the area to actually provide on warm referrals to other services and and provide those if we don't have capacity um, within our team so i think even kind of looking at the very basics of that that level of data but 
that that type of um, output driven kind of data can also tell us um, so let's just say we've got an increase in um, managing suicide risk that comes in and we collect that data so we can have a look and if we can see an upward trend in the amount of um, suicide risk assessments that our therapists are having to do every week or every month we can actually trend that and graph that but then we can go okay that's an increasing trend but now let's actually look at the at the clinical response for that so is our staff actually responding in a way that we would like to see them respond according to evidence-based practice for that for that area do we have the correct kind of connections with health services and child protection services and do we need to actually train our staff and provide more support and you know is there some vicarious trauma that's going on with this increasing trend of having to respond to to suicide risk in children and young people so it you know, there's there's so many ways to actually look at the data. Um, it's so easy not to though. It's very, very easy. And often um, therapists themselves and service providers and managers are very time poor. You know, we have the, the um, you know, asking to do more with less and data goes to the bottom of the, to the bottom of the pile. And certainly interrogating the data that we, that we have and trying to make sense of it and pull out trends um goes to the bottom of the pile after that so it is a um i think it's more complex and difficult for smaller organizations larger organizations sometimes have whole whole departments or roles that are actually dedicated to to this to looking at data and to capturing it and having those systems in place smaller organizations really struggle with the um the resource that it takes to actually look at that um, and then give the time to it but then actually implement changes because of it. Um, you know, once you recognise the problem, you then actually need to take steps to resolve the to resolve the problem as well. Okay, great. That um, issue of time um, poorness, poverty, um, opens us up to that to a question of like, well, how do we alleviate that? Um, which mm -hmm. I will leave for the question section because there's some questions that could um, mm -hmm. provide some opportunity to think about that. Um, and I am conscious of time, so I'm going to ask James um, just one last quest or question on, um, I guess, the broader service system. Um, you know, thinking about the child advocacy centres and thinking about um, the sort of multi-agency approach um, that that uh, advocates. Um, and also in terms of the uh, conclusions that you've drawn in, um, the two papers that you've done for um, CFCA, you've noted that um, engagement and completion, completion of therapy needs to be systematically tracked to more completely track the outcomes and impacts of sexual abuse services, um, and that services and systems should monitor their own um, data on risk factors and disengagement. Thinking about this from a um, sort of integrated systems perspective, um, what, you know, aside from, I guess, the, the sort of therapeutic outcomes or sort of treatment you know, information that um, specialist services might be um, looking to. What might be the, or from your perspective, is the sort of critical information um, to draw from the broader service system to help understand, you know, where the gaps are, for instance, you know, you talked about that, um, you know, that sort of leakage right at the beginning. What from, what we can, what can we obtain from other services that would help, you know, plug the leakage, stitch the pipe together. I'm not sure about those metaphors, but you know what I mean. Those, that isn't a two, that isn't a two barrel question. That's a two bazooka question, I would say. <laughs> First part, in terms of multi-agency responses, I, um, look, I, I'm, a, I'm a true believer that you get people together in a room, they solve problems, they view the case more holistically. Um, I think the challenge is, and this maybe gets gets back to your point, is is about adaption and understanding local context. So we have this, you know, thinking particularly about child advocacy centres, we have this evidence base for them, which is primarily from the early 2000s in the US. Practice at that time that it was compared to was really crappy, like really, really terrible, like unqualified people doing child interviews, all sorts of wild stuff happening versus really well-developed, really well-resourced, 
holistic response that was developed and implemented really well. So it's not surprising that there's a pretty dramatic difference between the two things. So that's that's where we start from in terms of the evidence base. Then when we were looking at you know, how to roll that out in Western Australia and, and, and what outcomes we could expect as a difference, we had to sit down and say, all right, well, what's the actual like theory of change for this thing? If you do all these things, you get these things. But if you're not doing all those things, if you already, already have qualified interviewers working, if you already have you know, fairly child-friendly facilities, if you take some of those things out, what can you realistically expect to see? And I guess some of our work was, was really about getting realistic about what difference in outcomes you're likely to see when you're only doing some of these things. Um, and I guess moving to your point about the, uh, you know, the therapy engagement, a lot of the re existing research was very focused on the criminal justice system because they were initially developed around minimizing trauma and distress from the criminal justice process as well as you know facilitating you know disclosures and, and things like that i guess where i've got to and what i'm really interested in is um thinking thinking about things as a system about where the gaps are the research suggests that there may not be sort of generalizable challenges or you know things going on so what it suggests is that you sort of need to go back to the data on thinking from that initial point of disclosure where are people ending up in the system so are they making it to services what are the barriers to getting to those services how long is it taking now getting that data is is challenging often in some of these jurisdictions that have really fragmented service systems. Could be going to NGOs, could be going to government, could be going to private practitioners. It's scattered all over the place. And unless we have a common start point, we don't really know. But I guess the what I really wanted to, 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 to talk about and what I'm really jazzed about doing, and you know, we'd love to hear from people that are that are interested in you know in, in working together on this is is thinking about how to use data to solve some of those problems. So I, um, I taught a, a really interesting intervention in, in, in Chicago and what they had done was sort of monitored over multiple years who was getting two services and who was not getting two services. So they had various processes as well as getting you know, sort of consumer feedback about that, but you don't get to hear from everyone in that process, whereas this was monitoring everyone. And what that then led to was, hey, we have these problems, here are the here are the things that are stopping people from getting to these services. Here is get, who's getting them and who's not getting them. And they undertook a process of intervention development to solve some of those problems. Now, what that looked like there was a centralized wait list. So the idea was instead of being on 10 wait lists, you're on one. Once you get to the top, you can try out all these different services. So you get one that's in your area at a time when you want it, in the language you want it, and you have a therapeutic alliance with the, with the person. So that sort of solved a lot of problems for them. They uh, did some work with the advocates, so they trained them in motivational interviewing. Um, they signed sort of all the services up in their network to a minimum standard for therapeutic services so that they had assurances that everyone was sort of getting the same thing. So you didn't have to send them to in-house services. And the beauty of all this was that because they were monitoring engagement and completion, they were able to say, hey, the interventions that we've put in place have improved, you know, reduced wait times and improved engagement with these services. So they're getting to, to everyone. Now, my point about this is not to follow the intervention development they did, but to follow that process of getting the data to understand what the problems are in individual jurisdictions and use that data ideally with victim survivors, with professionals and and with government to say, hey, what are, what are the low cost interventions we can put in place that um, make it so that services are accessible and, and we're not just sending you know, untreated trauma out into the community? I feel like you were just, like you're sort of warming up, James. That's yeah. <laughs> a lot to say. Um, I do and, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate it, it's great. Um, we've got 10 minutes left to, um, for this webinar and we've got some questions that have come through. So I want to um, switch gears and actually, James, I'm glad that you talked about um, some practical examples, you know, sort of some examples of, um, you know, where that data, how data has been used to um, change practice. So thank you. 
Um, we received a couple from the uh, at the regis point of registration. So I'm going to um, select some of those there and some live questions that have come through. Um, and we may not be able to get through all of them right now, but people can rest assured that we will answer them. Um, one question is, um, one of the questions is, as a um, NGO, we may not have access to broader systems slash government data that helps us identify trends or needs. Um, any suggestions? I think there's one is more um, more conversation and lobbying with government to actually get that data. And just kind of picking up from James's point, there's a there's an issue, and I think regardless of what jurisdiction you are in Australia, with linked data. So, um, you know, linking data in police to child protection to health to the NGO sector and the private sector, particularly within child sexual abuse. Um, is is really fraught and it's very fractured. And so I think there needs to absolutely be more lobbying of that. And I know there's certain things in um, some national strategies and pieces now that's actually calling for linked up data and um, for improved data systems, so fingers crossed. But I think there's also, there's a lot of power in the NGO sector. And I think that is, that is a missed opportunity sometimes. There, we have a, a huge network in the community service sector, not just within child sexual abuse, but within related areas um, right across Australia. And you know, de-identified aggregated data can be shared and can be used. And I think it's a, you know, speaking to the agencies next door and speaking to the agencies in the suburb over and and actually finding those networks and developing those networks. Um, you know, sometimes it's only a cup of coffee and, you know, a, a, a catch up like that. And to be able to share that data and information, I think is really valuable. And that has a lot of power, I think, and you can really create quite a big picture just from the community service sector and the data that's available there. Okay. James, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, um, look, I don't know if it's totally relevant, but I just got to thinking about information sharing and some of the challenges that, that happen around that, specifically in you know, child sexual abuse. Um, often, and I've noticed this in a few different jurisdictions, is there will be legislation or, or I guess, you know, information sharing guidelines that are, are passed and agreed to, but not carried out in practice. And it's really odd, mm. really odd. I've been there at, at situations where the person that sort of, you know, passed the passed the ISG walks into the room and people are running up and they're like, hey, this happened and this happened and this happened. Am I allowed to share information? And she's like, yes, yes, that's why we passed ISG. And people are just running up to her and like, am I allowed to share this information? She's like, almost always yes. Yes. <laughs> Almost always yes. <laughs> and it, it just got me thinking, I, I guess, like you, you pass things like ISG in um, information sharing guidelines in, in SA, or you, you know, you have, you know, you can, at, at one level you kind of have this thing where you've said, all right, here's the conditions under which you can share it and, and that's fine. And, you know, maybe within the complexity of, you know, NGOs dealing with government agencies and things, there's, there's nervousness about that. but yeah, I just think within agencies, some of that nervousness is odd, and I mm. don't understand why there are barriers to, I guess, using information sharing guidelines, especially when it, you know, it's clearly in the best interest of children. Why it takes so long for people to be convinced that their um, their agency isn't going to, you know, come after them for complying with them, um, you know, ISG. Very odd. I, I don't know. That's a question, but um. It sort of relates to that 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 issue of um, yeah working across agencies and, and having that confidence to share mm. information about, you know whether it's individually or whether it's at an ag aggregate level. Mm. But if we put your, your two responses together, what we come away with is there's both the sort of formal mechanisms like in, you know mm -hmm. information sharing guidelines and understanding what they are and what they enable, as well as the kind of, you know, power of the NGO sector and, and the connections and, and that lobbying and, and, you know, putting those together can become really powerful, I think. Yeah, um, absolutely. 
Um, we've got four minutes, so we might have time for one more question. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm just reading here. Might be a bit complex for right now. Um, here's a, a good one. Is there capacity for services to collaborate with research organisations? Services may be collecting the data and researchers have the know-how and possibly the time on how to analyse the information. What are the, what are the kind of, I mean, in a sense, you kind of are a model of that, but what, what are the opportunities and what are the things that make that um, possible and make it work? Mm. Yeah, it's complicated. It's gotten more complicated. Um, yeah. I think... What, yeah, why is the, that? Can you, can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, look, I don't think there should be a sob story about researchers because we've got great jobs. We get to do interesting things and, and all sorts of stuff. We don't always get to do exactly the stuff we want to do. And often we have to go begging to find salary money to do the things that we're int really interested in doing and the things that are really impactful. Yeah. So, mm. I mean... Don't shed a tear for me or anything, but um, it's uh, it, it can be challenging to to get that time to to do that really industry focused work that can have really big impacts because you know yeah. sometimes that's not the stuff that you know our incentives are built around. But I think in terms of NGOs wanting to seek and establish partnerships, um, I think that's a very good thing, and I think there should be more of it. I don't know how you facilitate it. Um, yeah. Definitely some academics do have time and, you know, it sort of has to do with the structure of how we're employed, whether we're a 40, 40, 20, so whether our, our sort of teaching subsidises some of our research time or whether we're research only and, you know, we're more or less having to find our salary from, from various pieces of work. That can set up, you know, some of the complexity of, of working with NGOs. I think the other thing, and, you know, I've sort of seen from some contexts is NGOs have this experience of researchers coming to them at the last minute of, you know, the ARC or, or something like that saying, hey, we've got this project and, you know, can you be our industry partner on it and can you give us $20,000 and, and that sort of stuff. And I think that that sort of undermines, I guess, the what you want to see is that enduring relationship between service and research that you sort of build up that quick pro quo where it's not a problem if, you know, people are asking you to, download journal articles for them or whatever else, you know, don't tell, don't tell Springer or whoever else that I'm doing that. But, um, but yeah, Amanda, I, I think, I guess we kind of have a pretty direct experience of, you know, research, yeah. you know, partnerships. So you can talk to that. Yeah. I think, um, I think there's a, a research partnership with an NGO and a research centre um, is, can be a great marriage but it can also end in divorce and I think the reason why I say that is a cautionary tale for um, NGOs we we think um, you know putting my community service sector hat on uh, we think what we do is great and um, it's you know sometimes we might find some extra money and go out and want a researcher to research it but if you do that you open it up you know be careful what you wish for it might not you might think you are doing a great job and I'm sure many are, but you also need to be open to, a researcher will evaluate what's in front of them. There either might not be enough um, outcome data to actually make a judgment or whether it's working, or you might find that actually what you're implementing is not making a difference or a sizable difference um, as you think it is. Um, but on the flip side of that, it can be a brilliant relationship in terms of working with a researcher. Um, I think the, it's an excellent opportunity for community service sectors to improve their level of outcome data and their type of outcome data in terms of their pre-assessments and post-assessments and how they, um, how they do that and upskilling their workforce and upskilling their workforce to actually start interrogating research as well and what the literature is saying around a whole range of different things. So I think it is a, um, there should be more of it, there absolutely should be more of it, but both parties, the researcher and the community sector organisation, need to go into it with a very open mind, with a true partnership and a, you know, ready to kind of embark on a journey and not predetermine the outcome and, and not have predetermined expectations around that outcome, I think. Um, 
is, is probably the biggest piece. But it, um, you know, it, I, I think it's a, it, the community service sector, if they have the, the funding behind it, they should be doing more of it and government should be funding the community service sector to actually evaluate their programs more um, to actually do that. And I think we are seeing a slight shift in um, particularly in the outcomes driven framework and funding that is um, that is starting within government and treasury now, uh, certainly for WA, I, I think we'll start to see more of that inbuilt evaluation in um, in service contracting, fingers crossed. Yeah. Mm. So just uh, looking at the questions that are coming through, um, we have a question around how do services leverage their data to advocate for their services or programs? Um, I might um, throw that one to you, Amanda, in the first instance, and then James would be interested in your views as well. I think it's a really, it's a really good question. And if we start with uh, government, they are moving more towards an outcomes-based um, uh, program, I suppose, in terms of funding, uh, funding and also, um, you know, reporting back on services. But in a philanthropic space, there's a lot more philanthropic support, I think, um, for child sexual abuse and child protection related issues and family violence and those type of things um, across Australia. But they are much more particular around the types of information that they want to see and the feedback that they want to see in terms of their value for money. So, um, you know, if I'm a philanthropist and I've earned a hundred dollars and I'm giving my a hundred dollars over to you to provide a service, I don't want to know so much how many times you've given that service. I want to know the impact of that service. So I want to know what it means for the person that you've actually provided that service to. And so I think there's a, um, you know, there's a, a significant piece there where organisations that collect outcome data, if it's the right outcome data, um, so looking at the, um, the impact of their interventions and they can actually marry that to the cost of those interventions as well, then that tells a really good story for potential supporters of ongoing funding. It also allows um, organisations to make a case to government and to potential donors and sponsors and in grants and applications and things that there's a gap, there's a need, there's an issue and hey, we've got the solution and this is how much it's going to cost. And this is the this is the benefit of that solution, not just in abstract kind of terms, but to children and young people. So they can actually really see and, you know, um, Everyone loves the graph. Everyone likes to be able to tell a story. You know, they say like it tells a thousand words and it absolutely does. Being able to show um, that a selection, that a group of clients that you've worked with have decreased in their symptomatology in terms of trauma related symptoms to child sexual abuse and, and to be able to have a, a narrative that goes along with it where you've got some, some children really talking about this their um their experience of the service and parents talking about that that tells a complete picture around the impact and that's a really powerful story to lobby government and to lobby um potential supporters for for ongoing funding or to fund something new where there might be a gap um i think there's a, a huge amount of responsibility that comes with that in terms of service providers making sure that they use their, their data, whether it's output data or outcome or consumer kind of feedback, they have to use it in a very uh, ethical, transparent manner. So collecting data, clients need to be aware that it's going to be used, de-identified, but that, mm -hmm. that their information will go into a bigger pool of information and that it might be used for these type of things. Um, and you know, that as service providers, you, explain the data in a very factual um, factual way um, without shaping it or um, you know or so I think that's a that's a really critical thing to remember as well the responsibility with it mm. okay great James what's the the role of researchers do you think in that um, you know in that process I suppose what can researchers contribute to that whether it's you know with the services or thinking about from you know governments as well um, as commissioning agencies, what what can researchers do to help 
that service um, help services leverage their data. Hmm. Sometimes with, uh, I guess, the funding pitch, I don't know whether you want to talk to a researcher, whether you want to talk to a good PR person or a policy advocate, <laughs> but um, like, I think we would like the funding environments to be a meritocracy and to be logical, but I don't think they are. I don't think they ever will be because mm. there's different types of money to different priorities. There's different, I guess, you know, fundamental you know, housing is one thing and disability is one thing and they're all different pots of money. There's different regions. It's all, I, I guess, a kind of like beautiful chaos. And you hope that through the kind of discourse and argument and, you know, evidence being provided that you do end up with things that have merit, you know, uh, prospering and, and things that are underperforming you know, sort of um, either changing or or or, or move, being moved off funding. But I don't think that's how it works. Um, how researchers contribute to that, I don't know. On one hand, we can be a gun for hire and we can be the people that, you know, help you put your best foot forward for your program. The other hand, like Amanda mentioned before, um, we can be the person that tells you that you're, on a thing that you know isn't fully defined that isn't you know ready mm -hmm. um and i guess that's something i was thinking about before is the pressure to demonstrate outcomes straight away is huge mm -hmm. potentially mm -hmm. quite destructive for programs because mm -hmm. there is that pressure to sort of bed things down and formalize procedures and you know have it be mm -hmm. you know fundable within a certain time period and mm -hmm. these things take a really long time to, mm. you know, rubber hits the road and you're sort of seeing real clients and you're adapting the program mm. for the kind of complexities and, you know, the one-off events or the things that are, mm. are unusual. Submitting your program to scrutiny very early, I, I think that mm. can sometimes be kind of destructive. Um, mm. I think the, the term premature evaluation sort of exists where, well, I guess programs that are still finding their way and still being formalized and turned into a, you know, a program that's you know recognizable um the analogy is sort of like pulling a plant up to examine its roots and that's um yeah it's um yeah it, it's challenging to, to think about what's the what's the right place for researchers in in all that because obviously you sort of talk about Internal research that might be, you know, helping you um, put your tenders or your, your pitches forward. Um, and how to engage with external researchers that might, you know, be asking uncomfortable questions sometimes. Mm. Mm. I think um, just to add to that, it's there's also a balance. We, I mean, you know, this is an extremely important discussion around how we use data and capturing data of different types. But at the end of the day, we've also got a child and family in front of us who are deeply distressed, who have experienced, um, you know, potentially the most horrific thing that they will experience in their lives and are going through the process of disclosing and trying to work out what their new world is going to be like. Getting them to fill out uh, questionnaires, getting them to do assessments is, that's not always appropriate and it can't be, it has to be a balance. And I think practitioners are the ones that know best when they can actually give that assessment to that client. You know, is it appropriate to get them to fill out that checklist or that consumer survey or whatever it might be? And policy designers and service developers and those people managing programs, it, they might have a motivation to have the data, but the practitioners need to hold the client at the center of that decision making and exercise their practice wisdom and what they feel is appropriate and what's not. And that those two sometimes don't match up and they don't marry. And um, I think that's a, it, it's often a, a tension to a, at that service delivery um, end. Mm. That's a really good point, Amanda. Mm. Um, and I do like the analogy of pulling up a plant to see by the, you know, pulling it out and examining its roots to see how it's traveling, you know. Mm -hmm. um, 
one last question that I guess is the sort of flips. You know, we've been talking about something quite meaty around leveraging the, the data. There's a kind of precursor question, I guess, which is a little bit more straightforward, um, which is, is, are there ways to reduce the manual entry of data by service providers and to help alleviate the time demands required in collecting mm -hmm. service level data? So how, how can we make that easier and more efficient? Um, it's the million dollar question because it's so expensive to do. Um, you know, years ago, we would have Excel spreadsheets and like a hundred Excel spreadsheets and paper and stacks of paper that, you know, would take hours and hours. I think as technology has become more sophisticated, data capture of a whole range of different things has become more advanced as well. Lots of services now, you know, you go to a hospital um, and sometimes on the way out, there's a quick consumer feedback where they quickly just tap on an iPad for what their perception um, was like today in terms of the service that they received. Um, lots of, I know some service providers are actually doing that now as well. So having their intake and exit questionnaires either given to clients on an iPad in the wait room before their session or sent to them via a an email link, you know, some very basic kind of survey monkey type things are being generated now too, which can be done. And then, and then it's just as simple as generating a report, um, all day identified. So I think there's loads of ways to use, loads of ways to use the technology that's now available. The easiest I think is getting the clients to fill it out themselves um, on a device that's um, easily available or in the privacy of their own home via an email or text message link. Mm -hmm. There's also the flip of that though, in that you have to then be extremely careful around the content you're asking them to fill in. There's security issues as well in terms of um, sending information via email and unsecured email or um, in the cloud and what kind of um, what security protections you've got from an IT perspective within your organisation. Um, and you have to ensure that the content's not distressing for the client to mm -hmm. fill out if they're filling it out in their own home or in a wait room before they leave. So huge benefits of doing that type of thing and definitely cuts down on, um, on staff time to actually data to enter it. Um, but we then just have to take a step back and think about what we're asking of clients. And also for clients where you know, English may not be their first language. They may not have great written or um, or verbal, you know, literacy skills. Um, they may not have access to internet and those type of things. So, just the accessibility then becomes a um, becomes a further consideration too. Okay, great, thank you, James. In your travels, what did you see? Did you see any sort of magic bullet that said that, that kind of, <laughs> you know, that answered the the sixty four million dollar question? Yeah, I think there's some clever stuff in the pipeline. I've seen some stuff around text mining and, you know, sort of use of technology to automate some of these things. You know, if you wanted paper-based things or, you know, things that are PDFs turned into, you know, data, you'd have to hire someone to sit down and do the quite laborious work of, um, of putting that in. Um, yeah, there's people working with all sorts of, um, you know, clever computing things to um, to address some of those solutions. So hopefully um, we can see that sort of popping up in um, in the sector. I think we are slow to adopt technology in the um, <laughs> social So um, yeah, I hope to see that. Uh, and, and, and yeah, even things like, um, you know, people writing codes sort of translate people's, you know, agency database into standardized data across multiple agencies. Mm -hmm. I think there's all sorts of clever things going on and, and maybe it gets to the need for a broad skill set across the sector where there are people who you know, know how to use technology and apply mm -hmm. machine learning, apply all the, you know, the big picture things that you know, are happening in the technology sector to, to the sector. But of course, as, as Amanda mentioned, with an eye to, I guess, the sensitivities and the, the appropriateness mm -hmm. of some of the things. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, great responses. That's all we've got time for. So we're going to sign off. Thanks to James and Amanda and thanks to our listeners. We'll see you next time. Thank thanks you so much. much.